Oh. Very good. So let's welcome Rosemary Irwin. Well, um, welcome everyone. I, I guess I've got something I've got to, there you go, got off my screen. Welcome to a discussion of Mark Twain and the Civil War. Whoop, and I'm going to make my, see if, ha, there we go. Now, um, when we talk about war in America, we all know it from elementary school. And obviously America would start with the Revolutionary War. But if you were alive in America at the time, there were lots of little wars going on. So you had the Northwest Indian War, you had the Quasi War, you had the First Barbary War, and I won't read every single one of them, but I've got this just to emphasize that we think the next time you worry about a war is 1812, but then there are all these battles going on because the United States, the people who within the United States may think they own the United States, but there often are a lot of little side wars to prove it. Um, Mexican-American War. And I've put with these little things on the wars, little numbers of people who died. So when you're thinking of the Mexican-American War, 17,500, but then, you know, these little wars about, you know, between a um, hundred and um, 500 people, then you have the Civil War. At least 618,000 Americans died in the Civil War. And some experts that I have read believe that the toll should be estimated more at 850,000 people. Um, so the American Civil War, you're talking 1861 till 1865, absolutely devastating. Um, of, of every 100 Federals in battle, 112 were wounded. Of every 1,000 Confederates, 150 were wounded. And even if you look at all the wars we've ever been in, the Civil War is still the worst in terms of casualties. So when we think of the Civil War, we think of this time, we think of the rebels fighting the Union, we think of the Confederates, the Union, we think of the battles. What people don't necessarily realize when you're thinking of men in Civil War America is there was a whole third very large important group, Western settlers. And you actually even had the opening of settlements by Abraham Lincoln. Um, so I bring you Mark Twain because arguably, or he might have argued, he kind of was in all three camps at different points in his life, or at least he told very important stories of what was happening and made sure that history was retained. So what, you know, Mark Twain was... I had his own way of putting things. He said, I am not an American. I am the American. So if somebody's saying, well, well okay, what, what exactly are you saying he did? He was a printer. He was a steamboat captain. He was a prospector. He was a reporter. He was speaker. He was a, a soldier. He was a short story writer, a novelist, a publisher, a stand-up comedian. I'm saying that, but if you look at what he really did, he seemed to originate stand-up comedy, um, an inventor, a political commentator, a capitalist, a social critic, a travel writer. And when you are talking about the end of the Civil War, he wrote a, a, a story you may have actually read in elementary school. It's a very, very popular American story, the celebrated um, jumping frog of um, Cactoveras County. And what's interesting about this story, and the reason I actually put it in as a little Civil War thing, it was enormously popular. It was enormously popular because at the end of the Civil War, the last thing people wanted to read or see or hear about was the Civil War. 
It was devastating, as I pointed out. And even you'll find that the very famous um, photographs uh, that were being put up in museums, all of those exhibits came down and people wanted humor. So when I am talking about those three types of men you could be, we'll start with how Mark Twain was, of course, of the settlers. And he brought people these wonderful visions of crazy possible set, um, settlement, always with a really good sense of humor. Um, he very importantly wrote about the Sandwich Islands, which meant he got uh, a trip to Hawaii and wrote all about what the early Hawaiians were about. And he was so successful with these written pieces that he got a friend to convince him to try speaking. And this is where Mark Twain became the famous speaker. I call him like the origin of stand-up comedy um, where he was speaking on the Sandwich Islands. He also kind of brought in a world vision because he was extremely popular, not only in the United States, and he had this wonderful sense of humor. So when uh, successful, very religious Americans decided they would take a trip to see all the important religious sites in the world, he got on the boat and he wrote The Innocents Abroad, which gave people a certain conception of Americans. And then he gave people the story of roughing it. And he had really, really roughed it. Now, this is not a biography of everything that Mark Twain did by any means. It, it would take way too long. He's spectacular that way. But realistically speaking, particularly a book like Roughing It, gave people a sense of the settlement and gave people a sense of the West as a place to go. Now, I've mentioned there were three categories and there was the category he was born into. He was definitely born in the South. Um, and I'm reading here directly from here. You have, you have heard from a great many people who did something in the war is it not fair that you listen a little moment to someone who started out to do something in it, but didn't? And this is from the private history of a campaign that failed. Um, it was, he developed it in his lectures and then it was published 1885. Thousands entered the war and just got a taste of it and then stepped out again. Permanently. And he's talking about this young group of men who know there's a war going on and they decide they're going to start to try to start their own regiment and they all go off like Boy Scouts and in their own little cabin. And finally, somebody is really talking about, okay, this is it, we've really got to go to battle. And you hear it's a crucial moment. We realized with a cold suddenness that there was no jest. We were standing face to face with actual war. We were equal to the occasion and our response, there was no hesitation, no indecision. We said that if what Ma Lyman wanted to meddle with those soldiers, he could go ahead and do it. But if he wanted us to follow him, we would. he would wait a long time. <laughs> now, uh, it's this is a very comic, but then Mark Twain does something that he very often does with his comedy where he's prepared you, you're laughing, and he says, all wars must be just that, the killing of strangers against whom you feel no personal animosity, strangers whom in other circumstances you would help if you found them in trouble, and who would help you if you needed it. And interestingly, when this was published, it was published in Century Monthly Magazine, a very prestigious publication. It was the kind of place where if you had been one of the greatest soldiers in the, or generals in the Civil War, you would publish in Century Magazine. But they published it, I believe, yes, for the humor, 
Yes, because they had a, 10 years past the war at this point, but also for that idea, for that quiet memory of just the, the pain and death. Now, the target of Century Magazine was the well-off, the well-educated, the definitely the, the best of the libraries. Mark Twain would say that my books are um, like water. Those of the great geniuses are wine. Everybody drinks water. <laughs> and everybody read Mark Twain. Everybody in the United States, he was read internationally. He was talked about in all the very expensive publications, but he was very often sold through subscriptions. So you would have people in the farmlands of the new settlements who got very little except the mail and there in the mail would be Mark Twain. And Mark Twain was able to do quite well. He, this is the Mark Twain house in Hartford, Connecticut. But we most often hear know about Mark Twain's summer writing cabin in Orion, New York. And in fairness, that really is as much a historical landmark as the Mark Twain house could ever be, if not possibly more. Because Mark Twain was a very busy man, a very ambitious man. He was working all the time. And for the summers, he would see, he would go to Orion to see his wife's cousin and he would do his writing. He would do his reading of his writing to the family. And eventually she built him a beautiful summer writing cabin. The most famous works of Mark Twain were written there. And uh, the year that this cabin was built, I get the final of the three that I'm talking about in the Civil War, Mark Twain's story now of a Union soldier. It was a story that was published in the Atlantic. It was a story that was told by a maid in Orion, and he calls her in the story Aunt Rachel. And he warns Harper's that this story has no humor in it. It's rather out of his line. And he claims it is as close as he can come word for word to what he was told. And, he, and they, the story began when he actually asked the maid, how is it that you've lived 60 years and never had any trouble? And this was when he was told the story of how this maid had been a slave and how absolutely devastating pre-Civil War was for slaves. And she had several children who her family decided to sell. And she sat there as they were selling all of her children and she clasped on to her last little boy and she said, no, you can't take him. I, I will I, you, I, um, take my life without taking him. And he said to him, mom, don't worry, I'll escape. I'll find a way. <laughs> and they did eventually take her son. She did work very, very hard. Then Northern troops came to her house, to the house she worked as a slave in. She was making food. And she saw one of the Northern soldiers had certain scars on his face. It was a black Northern soldier. It was her son. And so, you know, you hope, they, I, I, I sincerely believe this, this was a true story, um, but it definitely told a story that, that not only didn't often get told, but the way it got told in Atlantic Magazine, written by Mark Twain, this was a little boy born a slave who was there winning the Civil War. It's a beautiful piece. 
Now, I've got another Mark Twain book you may have heard of, The Gilded Age. We talk about it all the time. He did come up with the title. And the reason I'm mentioning The Gilded Age is because right after the Civil War, of course, we were in The Gilded Age. And this very, very much affects another person in Mark Twain's story who nobody would question his involvement in the Civil War. So we start off with somebody I don't think anybody's particularly heard of, Ferdinand Ward. He was known as the young Napoleon of finance in 1881. So he was doing spectacularly well. He got introduced to a young man who introduced him to his father. And he talked to Ulysses S. Grant and he convinced Ulysses S. Grant what wonderful business he had and he changed the title of his business to Grant and Ward. And wouldn't you know, his business did even better until it fell to pieces because of course he wasn't handling things well financially secretly. <coughs> now, Grant said of him, I have made it a rule of life to trust a man long after everyone else has given up on him. I don't see how I can trust any human being again. all over the newspapers. The question was, is Grant guilty? The conclusion is irresistible. General Grant's influence was used in some highly improper way to the detriment of the government and the benefit of um, Grant and Ward. Now this was, this did not happen. He was not, <laughs> Grant and Ward did not exist when General Grant was president. Um, it was, he was deceived so much that all of his own money was lost and he needed to basically divest and repay more money than he had to pay back. He also had to deal at the very same time with throat cancer that came from the fact that he'd smoked cigars his entire life. And he had very big arguments with Vanderbilt who wanted to just pay off his debts for him. And when Grant refused to allow that to happen, he basically bought certain things of Grant's and put them in his wife's name. But nonetheless, this was really very, very bad. He sold his the one sword he had saved from the Civil War. And Century Illustrated Monthly Magazine offered Grant a war memoir book contract with a 10% royalty. And then there was the Charles L. Webster and Company. And they offered 75% royalty. Where? Who? How? Well, see... Mark Twain had this idea in his head that he shouldn't be selling through somebody else's subscription company. He should own a subscription company himself. So he was starting this company and he thought, well, what a great idea. I'll start with Grant's memoir. And he would also start with some books he was working on himself. Eight years earlier, Tom Sawyer had come to define American boyhood. Um, Twain began writing Huckleberry Finn at the end of Reconstruction during the birth of the Ku Klux Klan. So he wrote Life on the Mississippi. That was not with his um, new subscription service because he had already had the contract out, but it was by subscription, probably the most famous book for just the incredible information about being on the Mississippi River. And if anybody who has read Huckleberry Finn knows, that book is as much about the Mississippi River as it is about the human characters. He had worked on Huckleberry Finn and worked on Huckleberry Finn. And then finally, after he wrote Life on the Mississippi, he was able to create the story of the escaping slave Jim and Huckleberry Finn, for the young boy from Tom Sawyer, probably 
uh, one of five most esteemed American fiction novels ever written. I, I'm counting five arbitrarily, but very, very important. Um, one of the things that happens in Huckleberry Finn is uh, Mark Twain is able to show how people talk, how they actually talk in the South, how they think in the South. And he's able to show that with this little boy who isn't particularly religious, who is basically flowing, floating off on the Mississippi to get away from civilization, that he believes certain things he's been taught in church. And one thing he's been taught in church is that the person he is sailing with who he has seen cry and talk of his family, it, well, it's not a person to him. He's property. And so that he, as he understands it, is actually stealing property because he is in on the same raft with Jim and that this is evil. And evil means that you will be punished by God. You And so he writes a special letter to tell Jim's master, where he is. And then as he is remembering all the wonderful things or all the, the things that have mattered so much to him that have interacted between him and Jim, we hear Huckleberry Finn unlearning what he's been taught. And he says, all right, then I'll go to hell. And it's a wonderful, wonderful line. It's, it's part of the power of the book um, because it, it, this was not an age where people assumed that getting into heaven and hell was not a part of, you er, judged by every single action you were performing. And uh, Mark Twain makes it even clear to us now to look back how people were thinking things through in these days. So February 1885, Charles Webster and Company distributed the first copies of Huckleberry Finn. It was the first book. And Concord, Massachusetts banned Huckleberry Finn because of its coarse, rough language. Directors of the Concord Public Library have joined in the general scheme to advertise Mark Twain's new book, Huckleberry Finn. They have placed it on the index of ex purgatoris. And this will compel every citizen of Concord to read the book in order to see why the guardians of his morals prohibited it. <laughs> and actually, <laughs> it was an absolute hit. It was constantly argued about, and it is argued about to this day. Mark Twain was asked to defend Huckleberry why Huckleberry Finn should be read by children in 1904, and this was his reply. I am greatly troubled by what you say. I wrote Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn um, for adults exclusively, and it always distressed me when I find that boys and girls have access to them. The mind that becomes soiled in youth can never again be washed clean. I know this by my own experience, and to this day I cherish an unappeased bitterness against the unfaithful guardians of my young life, who not only permitted, but compelled me to read an unexpurgated Bible before I was 15 years old. That I could ever do that and draw a clean, sweet breath again, this side of the grave, as the like young, um, as a young lady, will, she will tell you so. Most honestly, do I wish that I could say a softening word or two in defense of Huck's character since you wish it, but really in my opinion, it's no better than God's, and he's got uh, little biblical references, and the rest of the sacred brotherhood. <laughs> so there you can see he had a lot of fun with his critics. But I'm taking us back now to uh, General Grant, who was going to provide the second book for um, Mark Twain's company. And this is actually a quote from Grant. A verb is anything that signifies to be, to do, or to suffer. 
I signify all three. And he was not feeling sorry for himself. He was writing one of the greatest autobiographies ever written by a man who was simultaneously dying. Ulysses S. Grant finished his autobiography July 19th, 1885. He died July 23rd, 1885. So Grant's memoirs stand among the greatest literary works of the Civil War, according to historian um, Jennifer Murray. And the English military historian John Keegan said that this single this is the single contemporary document to explain the Union victory. So this is even internationally looked upon um, as a primary source of American history. But was Grant better off using Mark Twain's new company? Well, <clears throat> Charles Webster and Company sold more copies in less time than any other book in American publishing history. And I'm going to make a personal comment. I don't see very often. There's a tendency when people talk about Twain to talk about him as if he was a terrible businessman. And I don't think that's really quite fair. Um, he, it, look at here at Charles Webster and company. It would ultimately be that he, it would go out of business. <laughs> but he had two spectacular books. He just did not have anything after that that was quite at this level. <laughs> oh, I've got some other wars here, apparently. <laughs> this is only really, not to, to dwell on it, but to make the point that there were constantly wars going on in the United States. Wars that oh, we very often didn't learn about. Certainly the one in the center, we all know of the Spanish-American War. However, not a lot of us know about the Philippine-American War. If you look at the dates, right toward the end of Mark Twain's life. <laughs> Clarence Darrow put it well. History repeats itself. That's one of the things wrong with history. <laughs> now, when... Mark Twain was reading of what was happening in the Philippine-American War. He wrote a short pacifist story called The War Prayer. And I, I'm not going to read an entire story, but I am going to read the end of that story as the final tribute because it isn't technically about the Civil War, but I do sincerely believe it is so tied into the cost of war. And that was a cost that anybody who lived in the Civil War could not help but know. So the beginning of the story, you have this wonderful story of this church that they're celebrating soldiers and they have this wonderful sermon and everything is going really well. And then a stranger walks up to the pastor and motions for him to step aside. And this is what he says. I come from the throne, bearing a message from Almighty God. He has heard the prayer of his servant, your shepherd, and grant it if such shall be your desire, after I, his messenger, shall have explained to you its full import. Like unto many of the prayers of men, it asks for more than he who utters it is aware of. Is it one prayer? No, it's two. One uttered, the other not. If you beseech a blessing upon yourself, beware, lest without intent you invoke a curse upon a neighbor at the same time. You have heard your servant's prayer, the uttered part of it. I am commissioned by God to put into words the other parts of it, the part which the pastor and also in your hearts fervently play, prayed silently and ignorantly and unthinkingly? 
God grant that it was so. You heard these words, God grant us the victory. O Lord our God, that is sufficient. The whole of our uttered prayer is compact into those pregnant words. You have prayed for victory. You have prayed for many unmentioned results which follow victory. One must follow it. One cannot help but follow it. Upon the listening spirit of God, the Father also felt the unspoken part of the prayer. O oh Lord our God, help us to tear their soldiers' bodies to shreds with our shells. Help us to cover their smiling fields with pale forms of their patriot dead. Help us to drown the thunder of guns and the shrieks of their wounded, writhing in pain. Help us to lay waste their humble homes with her a hurricane of fire. Help us to wring the hearts of their unoffending widows with unavailing grief. Help us to turn them out roofless with their little children to wander unfriended the wastes of their desolated land in la rags and hunger and thirst, sports of the sun flames of summer and the icy winds of winter, broken in spirit, torn with travail, imploring thee for refuge for the grave and denied it for our sakes who adore thee, Lord. Blast their hopes, blast their lives, protect their bitter pilgrimage, make heavy their steps, water their way with tears, stain the white snow with the blood of their wounded feet. We ask it in the spirit of love, of him who is a source of love, who is ever faithful, refugee and friend of all that are sore beset and seek his aid and humble with and contrite hearts. Amen. After a pause, ye have prayed it, and if ye still desire it, speak. The messenger of him most high waits. So, very powerful. You could imagine, very offense, offensive. Uh, Twain wrote that war prayer during the U.S. war on the Philippines. It was submitted for publication, but on March 22nd, 1905, Harper Bazaar rec rejected it as not quite suited to a woman's magazine, Twain, eight days later, wrote to his friend, I don't think the prayer will be published in my lifetime. None but the dead are permitted to tell the truth. And because he had an exclusive contract with Harper's and Brothers, Twain could not publish the war prayer elsewhere. And this remained unpublished until 1923. I end with it because I am talking about Mark Twain and the Civil War. And I think as gruesome as it is, that was a gruesomeness that never died. Now, that much said, I do invite everyone, well, I'll get all, if I see where I should stop the share here, invite everyone, does anyone have a question or a thought? Great presentation. <laughs> Well, thank you. I do. Yes. Um, well, a couple. That that was awesome. Um, especially that that very end, um, that unspoken prayer was was powerful. Um where is Orion, New York? Is is that near Elmira? Oh gosh. Now now you're gonna ask me geography. I won't do geography well. <laughs> but, Never uh, heard of that. And I Googled it and I couldn't find it. I, I, oh, oh, I'm sorry, I said it wrong. Oh damn. Elmira? Elmira. Oh, okay. I'm so sorry. You know, you don't know when you make a silly mistake, but I'm so glad you mentioned it because it's yes, Elmira. And you and and, and you should see what I'm talking about in Elmira. And it's and it and Elmira has they are the shrine to Mark Twain. They are marvelous. <laughs> I knew Connecticut, Connecticut and Elmira were, were his two go-to places. And so Orion just kind of threw me there for a, a you, bit. I was wrong. You are so right to say it. I would have been so sad if somebody hadn't corrected me on that. Um, you. You, you, you're doing all these different things at once. And you go through words, and then you're saying it to me now, and I'm like, oh, what are you? And I, I thought you were just talking about another place in New York, and you were trying to. 
<laughs> oh, it doesn't matter. But thank you is, is what I'm saying. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Does anybody else have a question, even um, on Twain? I did research on Twain, but, oh, I'm telling you, when he lived to 80, he filled that life up. <laughs> you'd, you'd end up doing a week. <laughs> but, but anything that anyone wants to ask a, that kind of is in the air still. Well, and just, correct me if anything else, too. <laughs> just a little sideline. Um, my uh, son and his wife live in Reading, Connecticut. And the last, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight years of his life, he he moved from Hartford to Reading. And they have a library uh, in his memory uh, there in Reading. So I'm, <clears throat> it seems like I'm very steeped in, in Mark Twain lately. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, accident. he is worth your time. And I used to do a lecture on Mark Twain, and he managed in three different centuries to get bestsellers. And now you think, no, that can't be. He's like, but because he got it on Amazon when his final autobiography was published. That was in the 2000s. And of course, his first bestsellers were in the 1800s and then the 1900s. Just absolutely crazy. Um, uh, that and and definitely read to this day and and studied. <clears throat> so, <laughs> well, Rosemary, that was an unusually fascinating exploration into uh, two different aspects of life at the time, and I loved it. So, thank you so much for this evening's presentation. Really, we're really grateful to have you and, uh, to, and, to, and to listen to you on this cool winter night from the safety of our own homes. Um, I thank everybody for attending as well. And I hope the rest of you manage to get through the, the next month until we have our next presentation. Uh, so thank you. Okay. Have a good evening, everybody. Thank See you. you. Take care. Night.